Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity today to be in this place. And uh, Lord, we're talking about our values and the value of family. So important. Help us today, Lord, to, uh, to, to, find, to find courage mm. to do this the best we can by the strength of your spirit. Be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to start in the book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and I want to read you just a few verses here out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Now, I want to just pause right there for a second and give us context on this passage. So this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel who have come out of Egypt. It hasn't gone smoothly. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're literally on the brink of entering into the land. They're almost there. And God is saying to them, look, I've given you my laws and commandments. Be careful to obey them. Now, sometimes when we hear that, we're like, oh, man, if only God hadn't given us all those laws and commandments, life would be so fun. This is the trap. This is the trap we fall into. And this is what I need you to understand as we go into this discussion today, that God didn't give us his laws and commandments to make our life miserable. God gave us his laws and commandments to keep our lives from being miserable. We don't always see it that way because our nature wants to run after things that are contrary to God's purpose. But like I said to you uh, when we were in the series on the Ten Commandments, the Ten, I said I've never once honored the commandment of God and been sorry in the long run. I've also never once broken the commandment of God and, and not been sorry in the long run. Now, in the moment, I may have wanted to break it, but in the long run, I was always sorry. Not because God's vindictive, not because he brought down some major judgment in my life, but because the reason God gave us these laws is because to live any other way is to destroy your life. And this was something that David understood, and he talked about who else, to who else have you revealed your laws? <clears throat> we are blessed to know God's laws. We are even more blessed if we live according to them. Notice I didn't say we're, we're saved or more saved. I said we are blessed. And you know what? Your children are blessed if you have taught them God's laws as well. Let me go on. Verse 3. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. So the result of faithfulness and care to observe the laws is that it will go well and you will multiply greatly. Now this Deuteronomy chapter 6 is, is a very important passage, and we're about to come to a stretch here that's very critical to what we're going to talk about here. And it's something that Pastor Mark has, has talked about, focused on, and attempted to instill. And so I want to let him read these next few verses. So, so Mark, read to us Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. 
So the very powerful reality here is God is saying these things need to be familiar. And is God saying here these need, things need to be familiar when you come to church? Is that what he's saying? Well, he's certainly not saying don't do it there. But that's not where he's saying to put these things, is it? Is he saying these things need to be familiar? Your children need to experience them when they walk into a children's ministry building? Well, yes, but somewhere else that this passage is really talking about. Is this passage talking about when your kids go to Forest Lake Education Center, this is the place where these... No. Where do these things need to be front and center in the life? In your home. And this is an important point we need to understand here at the outset of what we're going to talk about today. The church is great for supporting your spiritual walk. But this can't be the full total of your spiritual walk. As we were talking about this last week in the context of worship. If this is the only worshiping you do, then this will be thin. And we'll fall into the trap of trying to put on a good enough show to get you to worship. Mm-hmm. And you'll fall into the trap of judging everything we do as to whether it's good enough. So, so it's about being worshipers that gather. And, and in the same way, what we're talking about in this passage, you can't expect the church to be the most important spiritual influence in your home. You can't expect the children's ministry building, no matter how new or lovely, to be the primary place where your child learns about Jesus. You can't expect Forest Lake Education Center to be your primary source. All three of these things I've mentioned are your supports. And let me tell you, you have amazing supports here. Fleece is an amazing support. The new children's ministry investment is amazing. This church is an amazing place. But the most important place for your children to learn about Jesus is in your home. And this is the reason that one of the values that's been chosen for this community is family. Now I want to say something about this because sometimes when we talk about family, people can feel left out of the discussion. So, so you, if you're single or something like that, or even if you've had a bad experience and, and you've been a part of a marriage and it's broken up, this can feel very hard. And when it feels like the church is focused on family, you feel like you're on the outside. But let me, let me try to help you with this a little bit if I can in two ways. Number one, Let me see the hands of everyone here who is not either a son or a daughter of someone. Okay, good. I'm glad there's no hands. You came from a family. It may have been the best family on earth, like mine was. Mom and dad are here. (laughs) So is my sister. May have been the best family on earth. It may have been a train wreck. And you're still trying to get your life back together. Can we at least agree that we would far rather that children today come out of a family that's really healthy and strong rather than go through what you had to go through? Can we agree on that point? Amen. We're all invested in this, and it matters to all of us. And let me add a second point to that. Not everybody in this church is mom, dad with children. But there's enough mom, dad with children in this church that if the families as a group are unhealthy, the church is going to be unhealthy. And you as a single person have a vested interest in the health of the community. Therefore, you have a vested interest in the health of the families in the community and a responsibility to this community. Now, now there are times, and let me add this piece, there are times when people come, become dear to your family circle. And in a sense, they become a part of that family circle. And that's been true for us here in this community, and I'm sure it's, it's true for you too. Because there have been a couple people in this community who have been very dear to, to Alicia and I and to our kids, so much so that, that we count them as part of family. One of them is Julie Cook, and the other is Sue Bond. She's part of our group. 
But I want to talk to you today specifically in the context of the mom, dad, kids dynamic. Now next Sabbath we're going to talk about togetherness. And that's about how we're all going to interact with each other. But this Sabbath we're talking about how we as a church can invest in healthy families. So I want to turn to the experts seated here to my right who know everything about family and have lived it all out perfectly every day. Thank you. Did you get your card? Did you get a card that says family there? If you didn't, uh, let somebody near the end of your row know and you can pass those down. But So this value says family, spiritually thriving family as a reflection of God's ultimate purpose. So in the beginning, God created male and female, put them in the garden, and he said, uh, be blessed, multiply, and fill the earth. So this is, this is core to God's original purpose. Now, there are three points listed below this, and we want to reflect for a little while here in this time on these points. The first one says, we believe every son and daughter has a responsibility to influence the next generation for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Pastor Barb, what, is, what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, I'm glad that Jeff pointed out that every one of you are included in this value because this is inclusive language because you all are a son or a daughter. And then it goes on to say that each son and daughter has what? What's the, has a responsibility to influence the next generation for Jesus. So as we think about that, you might say, well, okay, does that, is that the kids over there in the building, that children's building, that's who we need to influence? And I would say no. Gary, you know, you still need to influence Jeff, you know? And Jeff, he needs to influence Gable and the other children in his family and his grandchildren come, great-grandchildren. Those are all the generations that are connected to you that need to be influenced. And so we have to look at this in a broader perspective to say there's a lot of generations that we need to connect with. And what is our main responsibility? Is to help them to know Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that they just see that Jesus is part of our life, but instead that they see that Jesus is our life. That every part of our experience is influenced by Jesus and by a biblical worldview. You know, today it's real easy for people to compartmentalize and say, well, okay, I, I've got Jesus here at church, but do I really need to have Jesus at work? Do I really need to have Jesus at home? Yes. That's what this value is saying, is that we want to influence the next generation or all the generations that are connected with us to see that Jesus is the core part of our life. Now, Mark, that's what, when you read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that's what you were really talking about there as you read that, right? Expound on that a little bit. So here's what's scary. Mom and dad, if you're a mom and dad, raise your hand. I want to see how many there are. It's quite a few. Be proud of it. I know your kids are right next to you and you're scared and nervous about that. So, so those that raised your hands, you are the most, not only the most important, but you are the most influential person in your child's life. Designed by God. Amen. It cannot compete with your kids' Snapchat, social media, whatever they're on, you're the most influential person in your kid's life. And here's what's scary. Whether you're doing a great job at it or a horrible job at it, you're still the most influential person in your kid's life. It's designed by God to be that way. The, the amazing thing is, is is when you're reading the New Testament, you're going into the life of Jesus, you had the Pharisees, these spiritual police who showed up to test Jesus' skill level of theology, and they asked him, hey, Jesus, who, who, what is the greatest commandment in all the laws? Of all laws, what's the most important? He quoted Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength. And that is a prayer that is the most prayed prayer in the world. It's called the Shema. And so when Jesus answered that, he added um, a second. Love your what? 
neighbor, neighbor as yourself. Sounds a little familiar from our vision, right? Passion for God, passion for people. You look at the Ten Commandments, first four commandments, it's about the worship of God. Last six is about people, how we treat each other. So love God, love people. It's important. And so Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, which was a law designed for parents to be the most influential, Jesus-centered family and to take every opportunity that God gives you with your children while they're under your care to teach and disciple them to walk with Jesus. It's designed that way. And it, nothing competes with that when God designs something to be a purpose for. I was reading in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6 when God was talking with Moses and he was preparing Moses to go into Egypt and help take the children of Israel out. And here's what God said. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jacob. Can you imagine what that must have meant to Moses when he heard those words? Generations. Generations after generation after generation, as Moses was able to look back and say, oh, I have been prepared by this moment, for this moment by all the generations that were behind me. God has started something years back with Abraham, and he has brought that all the way now to my generation. What encouragement that must have given Moses to know that the work that God began with past generations was now to be carried on by Moses. But not only that, then who was Moses to mentor? Who was it? Joshua. He was preparing Joshua to take over. So the Bible is really clear here, Jeff, in examples as well as texts that we read that we are to pass on from generation to generation to generation. And uh, another text in Psalm 78, 4, it says, we will not hide from our children, telling, but telling them instead, generations to come, the praises of the Lord, of his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. So sometimes we wonder, what can we do? Well, just share what God has done in your life. Share the wonderful things that he's done and the praises that you give to him. You know, I, I just had to go at second service to do our baptismal class. And one of the things I do in the junior baptismal class is at the end of the class, every week they have to take home a sheet to their parents. And on that sheet, it says, juniors, share with your parents something you learned today in class. Then parents, for example, if we were talking about the Bible, parents, share with your junior how this was important to you, how the Bible is important in your life. And then sit down and together talk about what method you use to study the Bible because I want the parents to be involved in this process of baptism. I want the generations to be sharing the importance of knowing Jesus, not as a part of your life, but as your life. So, and the, and the blessing of this is powerful. So I, I sit here today and like, like Moses those years ago, or like Jacob, I can say, uh, I serve the God of Glenn and Claris. That's my paternal grandparents, mm -hmm. and the God of Gary and Rachel. Or I can go the other way. I can say, I serve the God of, of W.T. and Blanche. That's my mom's parents. I'm, I'm a part of that continuing story of what God has done and the way he has blessed our families as a result of that. Now, so that first point talks about all of us and our responsibility to the next generation. But the next point says... Because we believe family to be the greatest spiritual influence on the next generation, that's the point we were just making, we will invest in the development of spiritually thriving families. Now, there's two very important keys here. One is investment, and the second is this idea of spiritually thriving families. So, Pastor Mark, what is a spiritually thriving family? So... If you think back, or even now, you look around this room, and the people that you do life with, who do you do life with that look most like Jesus? I want you to think about who that person is. Are there people around you 
that look like Jesus? Are there married couples that look like Jesus? Are there families that look like Jesus? So when Deborah and I first got married, we always were trying to find couples that were 10, 20 years older than us to mentor us because they had life experience. And we would find those couples that we saw Jesus um, in their lives, in their families. And we have those couples uh, in, in our church here that we have um, journeyed with life, uh, journeyed life with. But when you think about a spiritual thriving family, it starts with the marriage. It starts there. And when you go to school, how many of you ever took a class on, here's how to be an amazing husband? Here's how to be an amazing wife? We don't and, need that class. No, well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It's only a men's class. But here, here, here's, here's what I want you to do. Let, let me make this room a little bit more uncomfortable. I want you to look at, if you're sitting next to your spouse, I want you to look at your spouse. <laughs> I'm going to look at Deborah over here. Mine's not here. Look at your spouse. <laughs> you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and I want you to say this to them. Marriage is so easy with you. <laughs> Go ahead. Do it. Do it without smiling. <laughs> See, there's a lot of liars in this room. <laughs> so, so, marriage is not easy. It is tough work. It is really tough work. And if you're trying to do it without Jesus, it's even tougher. And so, the, the point of a spiritually thriving family, if Jesus Christ is not the focal point, and it's not the intoxicating thing that surrounds your marriage, guess what your kids are going to be looking at? When mom and dad argue, when there's intense fellowship in the home, <laughs> what are your kids looking at? And what are you representing in that intense state that you're in as a couple? And so I think it starts with mom and dad madly in love with Jesus and madly in love with each other. Without Jesus, you're just mad <laughs> at each other, usually. And it's tough work without Jesus being in the center, but it starts with a thriving marriage. And, and Mark, along with that, I would say that you were talking about couples and stress and difficulties that they could have. And um, one of the things that also helps in the home is when couples are open to showing their children what mm. forgiveness looks like. Yes. You know, because um, you know, now I can speak to my husband. He's up in the balcony there. My husband is the most wonderful person at being the first to go and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And Lauren learned that early on from him. So, so children. <laughs> he gets lots of chances. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does, and he will testify to that. Um, but, you know, so when couples are thriving spiritually, it's all these elements that make a difference. It's not that you're perfect. It's that, that you know how to say, I'm sorry, and let's do over. You're, you're my hero, Les. Les. Deborah is a lot like you. She's the, I'm sorry. And I'm a lot like Barb, I guess. So. <laughs> so one of the other things, um, to get it off of us, <laughs> that is really part of a spiritually thriving family is stay, spending time in the Word of God together. And again, my husband is, he is, this is going to happen in our home. He takes the spiritual leadership we are going to have worship in our home. And uh, we were at some seminars, D6 and some other conventions, where this Bible was shared with families. It's called the Family Reading Bible. And it's just a really great family Bible 
because it allows you as a family to do the short path, the long path, or off the beaten path. Um, you know, when Lauren was little, we had more time, you know, but when she got into high school, hmm. whew, life changed. And uh, I can remember that Les and I said, you know what, we're going to choose the book of Proverbs. Hmm. And we're just going to read, we're not going to try and read the whole proverb to her. But while she was in the bathroom doing her hair, we would go in and open the Bible and say, here's a part of a proverb we want to hold to today as a family. How can we live this proverb out today? So allowing the Word of God to become central. Mm -hmm. And I know your family used this Bible too. Yeah, when we discovered this at that same seminar, we, um, you know, growing up as an Adventist family, um, you know, you have these little storybooks with pictures in them. I don't know if anybody remembers those. And when we looked at that, there was something that was um, uh, deeply embedded in my heart that I felt that, man, I want my kids to hear the Word of God being read. And I don't want bits and pieces of it. When they're smaller, the, the short path is good because the attention span is smaller. Um, well, except for me. I have attention span that's pretty small. But the short path is, is great. And we went through the short path two or three times when they were smaller. As they get older, uh, it's amazing that they would sit and they would listen, active listening, as I read a chapter to a chapter and a half to two chapters. And the way that this Bible is set up is that it has um, a reflection part where you ask the facts of what you just read. And so you, that's active listening. So then they answer the questions of the things that were just read. And then there's a part of uh, let's talk. And that is the application part and the application part of what you just read in that context. And then it says life matters and it takes it another step as a family what to be thinking and praying about. But the, the, the listening and hearing the word of God for our family was it was a non-negotiable and, and it, it was powerful because we would have other family friends come and like, okay, let's have worship together. And we'd pull this thing out. And it was amazing how, and I'm not bragging on my kids because they're not always great, but I won't brag on them on this time. The, my kids would sit and listen as you read a whole chapter. And their, their kids were, that were coming and listening for the first time were just like, oh, when is this going to be over? Because kids don't have filters really good. And so they just didn't, they, they weren't used to sitting for so long listening to something that sounded off. And, and the other piece that I would say with the Word of God is a lot of us drive down the road, we listen to music in our homes. I mean, you can ask whatever device, hey Google, hey Alexa, whatever, and, and it will start playing whatever music you have set it up for. What, what we found was, um, there was there's a thing called Seeds Family Worship. Parents, if, if you have uh, uh, kids in your house right now, just memorize Seeds Family Worship, and it's actually scripture songs. And Der Derek and Bodell introduced a lot of us to uh, um, scripture songs. And Seeds Family Worship does it for the kids. And it was really powerful because our kids started memorizing scripture. You know, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid deep down in my heart so that I may not sin against you, my God. It's a powerful verse, but you embed Scripture in your kids. And I, not only with the Word of God that I think is powerful, but praying over your children. Something I haven't mentioned, but pray, literally pray, laying your hands on your kids and praying over them. The one thing that Deborah, our kids will never have, if they are sleeping in our house under our roof, there is never a night in their life that they have not had one, either Deborah or my hands laid on their heads and prayed prayers of blessings over them. Don't take that for granted. They're listening to prayers. And, I mean, you can pray for all sorts. I pray for my kids' future spouses. That's a smart thing to do because that's going to be future in-laws that you're going to have to deal with if you're not praying for them. 
So, so, so it is a powerful thing to pray over your children and let them hear your prayers aloud. Scripture read out loud, music with scripture in it, praying over them. Let me, let me just add a point here. So I, I found uh, something that Ellen White had written. I don't know, you probably know, but if you don't, she's written an awful lot about family. And, and uh, sometimes... Sometimes the point is so obvious that it's ridiculous, yet we still need to hear it. And in and, and the end of this, it says, In order to interest our children in the Bible, we ourselves must be interested <laughs> in the Bible. Okay, that seems pretty silly, right? But if your kids are having a hard time being interested in the Bible... Maybe the first place to look isn't them. Maybe the first place to check is your own heart. To awaken in them a love for its study, we must love it. This is what I was talking about last week with, with worship. We can't expect our children to be worshipers on Sabbath if we haven't taught them to be worshipers throughout the week. And they're not going to be worshipers throughout the week if we're only worshipers on Sabbath. Hmm. It's all connected. Our instruction to them will have only the weight of influence given it by our own example and spirit. And if that doesn't lead us to a season of confession, then we're not really being honest with ourselves, I think. Because I can now think of many times where the example I have given is the opposite of what I want in their lives. But they're not going to love this if you haven't learned to love it. And Jeff, we have four of these family Bibles to give away today if there's a family that wants to come after the service. And you will intentionally say, I am ready to really sit down with my kids and be very intentional in the study of the Word of God. We want you to have this Bible, so please come and see us. Okay, so we got to keep moving here. We could obviously do this for about two hours because they're amazing, but we can't do that. But I do want to touch on this last point here. The journey of a Christ-centered marriage can be difficult. Hmm. Therefore, we support the influence of Christ in every family. What are we getting out there, and what are some of the supports? Well, as Mark mentioned, <laughs> you know, marriage is not always easy. Difficult, I think, is the word we used, right? Yeah. And... Um, some of you might use a different word, <laughs> but we chose the word difficult. Um, and so here as a church, we have resources that are available to families. We have Candy DeVore, who is on staff as a counselor. We have Lyris Bacchus, who is by contract here at the church as well, that families can come if you're in some type of crisis to be able to connect with them. Um, we also have a marriage seminar that's run in the spring, Jim and Mignon Waller. Um, Les and I went to that about a year, year and a half ago. It was wonderful because it refreshed for us ideas about our marriage, things that you forget. You know, you just get into a routine and you forget things that you can do. And it just really helped us as a couple uh, realize, hey, here's something we could do today that just can enhance our marriage. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier about when couples get into to difficulty, the one thing I think we really want you to know as a church family is we do not want you to suffer alone. We just absolutely do not want you to suffer alone. We're here as a pastoral staff. We have the counselors here. You know, a lot of times, Mark, we were talking about how shame mm -hmm. comes upon people when everything isn't perfect. No, that's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to live under shame. He wants us to live under his love, under his care, and to know that there's healing and restoration. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say that the single greatest lie that, the sat that Satan poses on your mind is that when your family is going through a tough time, when your marriage is on the rocks, when your kids start to go crazy on you, and the first thing that you start to think is, oh, what will people think of us? And you start thinking that, believing the lie that Satan is putting in your head, and that is shame. 
what are others going to think? So the body of Christ, as described by Paul, says that if one part of the body hurts, the rest of it should hurt with it. Does that make sense? Have you ever had a paper cut? Let me just real quick, just this is off script. Gable, come here. Just come here for a second. I just thought about this, but Gable, I'm going to just, uh, I want your pinky. Okay. That's a small part of his body. Okay. Now, I got teeth. And so if I were to clamp down on that, like a pit bull, just, and, and just right there on the pinky, just clamp down. Do you think that Gable's body is going to feel that pain? Every nerve ending in his body is going to tell him, ouch, it's going to hurt, right? Wouldn't it be beautiful if we knew that when struggle happens, and we know it does, it's inevitable, we live in a sinful world, when that sort of thing happens, that you could go to other people in the body of Christ and say, I need you right now. I need you right now. Will you pray over me? Mark, and, somebody just came to me after second service crying, hmm. and they just went through a difficult divorce. And they said so much shame was upon them, but yeah. they decided to fight that and came to church last week. And somebody saw them and said, we're so glad you're here. Would you please come to lunch with us? Hmm. And she said the healing that just began to happen in her spirit from the body surrounding her. Um, so, yeah, we, we shouldn't suffer alone. So one, one of the things that I've, I've journeyed for five or six years now with two men who have sharpened me as a man of God, as a husband, as um, a father, and as a son. And uh, these are gentlemen who we have had really tough, transparent conversations and through transitions of life. And I would say that um, the trick of this shame thing is you think that you have to do it alone. And having those men in my life has, has been very powerful. And I, I could not be who I am without them, and I have a long way to go. There is small groups that are being developed all the time. Pastor Julie is going to be blowing this church up with small groups. <laughs> and I would say start praying about your small group. Start praying about who's in that small group, that you will be able to bless them. They will be able to bless you because you guys can become the glue when disaster happens around that uh, family. So please, in, in this area, shame is a tricky, slippery slope, but you should never be isolated and you should never be alone in the body of Christ. Jeff, I also want to add, just going back to the second point, as a church, some of the investment that we're making uh, in family ministries. When I first came here, in fact, I see a few individuals here, uh, there was a family focus group, and a lot of it was focused on marriage and family to just strengthen the family unit. Um, but over the years, that kind of disappeared, and life got busy, kids got busy, all kinds of things that happened. And in mid-2005, uh, like um, everything here was just growing, the children's ministry, everything was really developing. But I had a real ache in my heart because I could see that mm -hmm. families were being bombarded by so many things, which affects marriages. You know, when you get kids in school and they're being pulled here and pulled there, um, Tracy Mastrapa, who was a teacher at Fleece, came on with us, and we began to develop the family ministry uh, aspect again of this church because we wanted to help families because we saw that there were some things that were missing. One was we wanted to help educate them in areas of need. Two, we wanted to help their social calendar try to come together and see if the church could actually help that. And three, we wanted to help develop within the family the spirit of giving mm -hmm. and service. 
And uh, Tracy did that for 10 years, then Gigi Shellhammer did it for a year, and then in this last year and a half, anybody know the name Jennifer Burgum? Mm-hmm. Anybody? You know, Jennifer has put a nuclear bomb into our family ministry, and all kinds of things are now happening to educate. Um, right now, just at this very time, there's a group meeting called The Lies That Girls Believe. There's 150 between moms and daughters that are attending that seminar, and it's helping them to realize that the world has all kinds of lies, shame, and all kinds of things that they're telling these girls and these moms, and we're trying to now give them a biblical viewpoint Mm -hmm. to say, you don't need to live under shame. You need to live under the banner of God's love. And so all kinds of things are taking place here at Forest Lake Church in those areas to help develop spiritually thriving families and marriage as part of that. So talking about marriage, one other point, and we got to wrap up here, but one other point, what else do we have here to help people in marriage challenges? Do we have any staff resources? Yes, we have Candy DeVore. I think, did I mention that already? Yeah, we have Candy DeVore. Oh, you mentioned yep. Candy? Yep. I must have dozed off. Right. <laughs> There's counseling for that, Back Jeff. to the attention span <laughs> issue. Hey, you need to pray for Alicia. That's, yeah. Just keep your prayers on Alicia. Well, on that point, <laughs> since you brought it up, and she's not here, by the way, today, because, you know, sometimes family thinks. So she and Arielle were at Markham Woods singing. You know, it's, it's nonstop in this community. Mm-hmm. But here's what I want to tell you. And I just want to take some of the stigma out of this, because sometimes that holds us back. You all know I'm married to the perfect woman, that's clear. We've seen that demonstrated. But we've been to counseling. Because it's tough to raise kids and have jobs and do everything you're going to do. And you reach points sometimes where there's an impasse and it's useful to be able to have a conversation with somebody else present. So I I don't tell you that to to do anything other than hopefully dispel the notion of shame you may have associated Mm -hmm. with that. Mark, you gave us a, just so you understand the reality of where we're at, you gave us a disturbing statistic that you noted one time in this community. Tell, Tell them what that was. Yeah, so I won't give you grade, I won't give you year, but been here for a while and I remember um, several years um, into youth ministries, there was one specific class. When I say class, that could be a seventh grade class, that can be a tenth grade class. One specific class that there were only three kids who had both parents still living at home married at the Forest Lake Church. This is not fake news. This is reality. Satan is out there to disrupt and destroy marriages and families. And that's why we have this as a strong value of the Forest Lake Church. Exactly. And so this comment at the bottom, we desire to create a culture of family faithfulness. Nothing would create a better setting for your kids than to know they were safe in that family togetherness, that family faithfulness that this family is dedicated to each other. So we hope from what we've shared, maybe it gives you some some encouragement in this moment. We hope it gives you a challenge We have a song that we want to sing as we close today that's centered on what really is the key. And it's, you know, you're going to hear this song and you're going to think, well, that's kind of a silly song. Yeah, it's a silly song containing the most important message you could ever learn. The key to good living. So what I want to do is, are you going to lead us, Jeremy? Are you leading the song? All right, Jeremy's going to lead our song. When we're done with that, I'm going to ask Pastor Barbara and Pastor Mark to stay here, and I'm going to ask them to pray a prayer of blessing over your families. And if you're with your spouse or with your kids, when they're praying, I want hand-holding here, all right? Hand-holding in church is allowed. 
And I want hands laid on the little ones. It's, it's nice on dedication day when the pastors come and lay hands on your kids. That's one day. As Pastor Mark said, you do it every day. So we're going to sing about what matters. And then they're going to pray blessing. And then we're going to go out and live this.